Amen. I was reminded uh, this morning, I was just thinking about a, a preacher in our own country, and he was asked to take a, a special meeting. Uh, it was on St. Patrick's Day. It was a wedding, and he had a funeral to do beforehand. And um, whenever he was conducting the funeral later on that day, he, he forgot where he was. And as he started to pray for the young man, he said, Lord, I commit this young man to the green sod and sure and certain hope of the resurrection. And that's, that, that wedding, the woman actually had a green dress on. So there you go. Whenever I think of this assembly over here, it's wonderful just to see what the Lord has been doing. And the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Word of God says that the blessing of the Lord is toward His people. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is even just to see uh, this assembly here uh, flourishing under the Word of God. And that's all that we have is the Word of God. That's all that we need. We need a movement of God. And I trust that even in your heart this morning, there's something that has brought to birth that won't let us settle just for the normal things of Christianity. And so we're really encouraged, and for Paul and Tiki and for the family and everyone here, uh, we send your prayers over from the Lifeboat Fellowship here uh, there in Northern Ireland. If you have your Bible this afternoon, we're turning to 1 Kings First Kings chapter 18, please. First Kings and chapter 18. And today and tomorrow is really just about honoring the Lord and to give him his rightful place. And that ought to be the fir first place in our heart. And so as we gather around the word of the Lord this afternoon, uh, that he would speak to us above the voice of men. Uh, we need to hear from God above everything else that we'll hear today and tomorrow that not only would we hear that, but we would be able to discern uh, what the Lord is saying to you and I today. He may say something to you that is different from what he will say to anyone else gathered here uh, over this weekend. And so we want to have ears that are, are open to the things of God, uh, that we would hear the voice of the Lord. Just before we read, let us bow and ask the Lord for his help. And you lift the prayer to the Lord. Say, Lord, speak to me today. Minister to my heart, Lord. Father, we bow before thee again, and Lord, we thank you for what you've been doing. We thank you for the blessing of God. We thank thee, Lord, in Jesus' name for bringing this house to birth. We thank you, Lord, for those foundation bricks that were laid so many years ago, and those years, Lord, where it was barren and empty. And yet, Father, we thank you, Lord, just like the valley of dry bones, you've breathed life again. And Father, we praise thee this afternoon that thou art the God of the living. We thank you that you're the God of the sudden intervention. And we pray, Lord, over this gathering today and even tomorrow, Lord, over this weekend, we pray that you would crown these meetings with victory and with power. We cry that you would leave, Lord, an open heaven between us even today, that you would open the portals, Lord, of heaven and pour us out a blessing. And so, Lord, we cry that not only for today and not only for tomorrow, but for the years that lie ahead, we pray that you'll raise this house up here, Lord, as a beacon in the darkness. We would pray that you'd put your mark, Lord, O oh God, upon this whole area and sweep multitudes into the kingdom and glorify your name. And Lord, as Solomon built the temple and Lord, that was there where all of the great artwork was and yet... Whenever he prayed, the glory of the Lord came down. And Lord, that is our desire, that God would come down, our souls to greet, and thy glory would crown the mercy seat. And so, Father, we pray that you would break through. We pray for your word, Lord, that is as a hammer. We pray that it will break the hardened rock. We pray that that word is a fire. We pray that it would burn in our heart. We pray that you would break the shackles and bring freedom and power and liberty into this house today, wherever we are, Lord, along the road of life. We pray that you'd find us, Lord, and bring us to where you want us to be. And so, Lord, we pray that you would unstop our ears. We ask that you would fill, Lord, this hall today with that conscious sense of God, the Lord, that you would pregnant the very atmosphere, Lord, of this house today with that awareness of thy divine presence that we would be conscious, Lord, like Jacob of old, that God is in this place. Oh, Father, we ask today that shut us in with thyself, Lord. Remove every distraction from us. 
Remove, Lord, everything that would occupy our minds. Everything, Lord, of a past week and everything, Lord, of coming days, we ask in these moments that we have together that you will hallow them, Lord. Oh, God, that we'll catch something, Lord, today that we'll never lose to the end of our days. Lord, go down into the very annals of eternity itself. And so, Lord, I give myself to thee, Lord. We realize that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and and not of us. And so, Lord, we pray for that cleansing, that sanctifying power over my body, soul, and spirit. And we ask in Jesus' name that none be seen save Jesus only. And so, Lord, make this, uh, this meeting this afternoon, make it a threat to the enemy, Lord. We pray as a result of these meetings, Lord, that you would break through into the powers of darkness. Oh, God, raise the standard again. Revive your people, Lord. Oh, Father, we have our eyes and our expectation set upon higher things, Lord, than what men can give us. We want the breath, the wind, the rook of heaven to breathe upon us. And so, Lord, we ask that even today that life-giving breath would come, Lord, oh, the streams whereof may glad the city of God, that river of divine blessing. We want to tap into it today, Lord, and so we give ourselves to thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First Kings chapter 9, 18, please. First Kings chapter 18 and the last verse. First Kings chapter 18 and the last verse. And the hand of the Lord was, was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying. So let the gods do to me and more also. If I make not thy life as the life of one of them. By tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that. He arose and went for his life. And came to Beersheba which belongeth unto Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, Behold, then the angel of the Lord touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came hither unto the cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word to our hearts uh, this, after, this afternoon. Out of all the characters that stand out in the Old Testament, even to the most casual of readers, there's none that stand out like this man of God, Elijah. He's one of the men that is in that great company of men like Daniel and David and Moses that the Holy Spirit inscribed over his life that he was a man of God. A man of God. It's one thing for someone else to say it. It's something whenever God says it. And whenever the Lord looked down over the battlements of heaven and he watched Elijah, he put that epitaph over his life. He was a man of God. You know, my dear people, just to get off the subject for a moment this afternoon, that's what the nation is looking for again. That is what God is looking for again. Men and women of God. Men and women that walk with him and talk with him. 
He knew God. He didn't just know about God. He knew him. He knew his word. He knew his will. He knew his ways. He knew his power. Whenever he prayed, the rain stopped. You know, whenever James, that man of God again in the New Testament, is penning his epistle, he puts the epitaph over Elijah. He prayed. He prayed. And then he goes on in the next verse and says, and he prayed again. And you know, my dear people, this morning, no matter who you're praying for, pray again. Pray again. Whenever Elijah was on the mount and it hadn't rained for three and a half years, he put his head between his knees and he cried unto God and he sent his servant to go and look and see if there was any signs of an answer. And the servant came back and he said nothing. And he said, go again, go again, go again, go again, go again, seven times. And on the seventh time, there was a cloud like a man's hand. Here was a man, whenever he prayed, he left his imprint upon heaven. Pray again. And I say to you, fathers and mothers, this afternoon, go again, go again, go again. And as you're going to hear tomorrow night concerning revival, go again, go again. And sometimes the enemy will come and say, well, your answer's not coming. Sometimes they will say your children will not get saved. Sometimes they'll say the need will not be met. But go again and again and again. Go again. Whenever he prayed, the rain stopped. Whenever he prayed, the widow's son was raised from the dead. Whenever he prayed, the fire fell. Whenever he prayed, a nation repented. Whenever he prayed, God intervened. A man of prayer, a man that not only said words when he prayed, but he was a man that broke through. And I'm sure there's some of you here today, and you know what it is to seek God. And you come out of the closet or you come out of the prayer meeting and you say, Lord, I don't feel that I've got through. Well, he went again. Go again. Go again. He was the man that stood before the Lord. Whenever he burst onto the scene in 1 Kings chapter 17, and he went into the royal palace, and he stood before Ahab, one of the most ungodly, one of the most wicked kings that Israel ever had. He said, the Lord God before whom I stand. He stood before the Lord. He stood before the king. He stood alone before the nation. He stood on his own against the powers of darkness. And yet, and yet, at the tantalizing accusations of one woman, the man that called the fire from heaven, the man that slew 450 false prophets of Baal and 400 false prophets of the grove, the man that was fed at the brook by the ravens morning and night, the man that was fed out of the widow's barrel, he ran at the accusations of one woman. This was the man that stood before God. This was the man that stood on Carmel on his own. And he runs. He runs. He ran. Here was a man that was on the run. I want to ask you a wee question today. Sometimes whenever we look at Elijah, we sometimes can be very hard on him. And we can say, my, well, he should have just stood his ground. He should have squared his shoulders and he should have braced himself and he should have looked into the eyes of ungodly Jezebel as he did with the false prophets of Baal and he should have just took a stand and he shouldn't have run. And maybe sometimes we would have said, well, if that hadn't been me, I wouldn't have ran. Well, I wonder this morning or this afternoon, is there anyone here on the run? Sometimes whenever we're in this secret place and God lays an area on, on our heart, something that we need to put right. 
some brother that we would need to see, some bill that we would need to pay, some apology that we would need to make, some area for us restitution that we would need to go and get sorted out again before there is a blue sky experience between God and ourselves. And sometimes God would put his finger in some area, some avenue, some issue in our heart. And just like Elijah here, you know what we would do? We would run from, run from. He ran 100 miles on his own out into the barren, bleak wilderness of Bathsheba. This man of God, this man that had the hand of the Lord upon him, and he came and cast right to verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he said, Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. He requested that he would die. He said to himself and he said to the Lord, it is enough. I've had enough, Lord. Do you ever feel like that? I'm sure this assembly and I'm sure our brother Paul and Tiki, over the last 10 years, like any other servant of God, there's times that congregations know nothing about it. Whenever we go home from shaking the hands at the door, and the smiles and the amen. And we close the door and we put the children to bed. And we get down beside our bed and said, Lord, I've had enough. I've had enough, Lord. I'm tired of the fighting. I'm tired of the remonstrating. I'm tired of pushing and pulling. And I'm trying, Lord, oh God, to bring your people to where they want you want them to be. Lord, I've had enough. That was the cry of Elijah's heart. Oh, I tell you, this man was weary. He was lonely. He was hungry. He was marked by uncertainty. And he was intoxicated with worry. After three and a half years of seeing God every day move in his life, after every day for three and a half years, knowing something of the supernatural provision of God, you say to me, Stephen, was it possible to get so discouraged so quickly? Yes, yes. Verse 5. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. This giant of the faith, this restorer of the nation, this servant of God, found himself in a situation here in this chapter and in this area of his life where he was in need of a new and a fresh touch from God. That's where he was. This man knew all about God. This man would have known the first five books of the Bible word for word. This man saw more than what you and I have saw. And yet there came an area and there came a day in his life where he needed something new and he needed something fresh. No one else would have known it. If any other of the people of Israel had seen Elijah that day, they would have said, there's the man of God. There's a man that raised the widow's son. There's a man that called the fire from heaven. There's a man that's in touch with God. But only God knew that this man of God no longer was living on the blessing of a past experience. Do you ever get out of touch? Are you out of touch? I tell you, one of the greatest curses in the evangelical church in Northern Ireland is this. We have Christians that sing about God, talk about God, pray to God, witness for God, but are not in touch with God. Not in touch. Don't have the ear to hear him. Aren't conscious of his divine presence. Know nothing of being intimate with God. Here was a man, I say again, he needed a new touch. 
I know of no better day than the 10th anniversary of Beth Seda Shalom for some individual or indeed this assembly or indeed every man and woman in this congregation today to get a new touch from God. This wasn't a touch from a man. I've had plenty of men and good men and godly men put their hands on me and pray. But I can tell you this from experience. It makes all the difference when God touches you. Makes a difference whenever he puts his divine hand upon you. One of the verses I was going to preach on over this weekend is found in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 3. It's whenever the children of Israel came out of the wilderness and they were there for 38 years. 38 years there was sun, defeat, death, barrenness, that the manna, that the quail, that the fire by night, the cloud by day. But they had gained no new victory. They had possessed no new experience. And round and round the mountain they went for 38 long years. And suddenly God came to them and this is what he said. He said, ye have come past this mountain long enough. Turn ye northward. And that was into the promised land. And I'm glad that they did that. Time for something, something new. And I want to lay before you in the moments that I have, and I want to talk to you about a fresh touch from God. A fresh touch. Whenever you hear a preacher, and you're maybe in a meeting, and you come out of the meeting and you go home, and you maybe say to your children or to your spouse, there is a touch of God in that meeting. There is a touch. Maybe it's some individual in the rise to their feet in the sing. My, and suddenly God comes. And you say that individual has a touch. There's a touch. Sometimes it's in a ministry. Sometimes it's in an assembly. Somewhere when someone whom God has put his hand upon. Someone that is beyond the eloquence of men. And something that is beyond even the gift. And even beyond the human ability that an individual may have. And there's something whenever you hear it and you listen to it. You say, that is beyond the voice of man. God is talking to me now. God. I tell you, the touch of the master's hand makes all the difference. You get an old fiddle there. And if you give me a fiddle, it'll make a few noises, but it'll not make a tune. But you get, the, you get the touch of the master's hand. You get a piano there. And you get a, a child playing on it, and they'll maybe be able to bounce three blind mice. But then you get a great master like Paderewski there who could bounce on the keys. And it's the touch of the master's hand that makes the vessel a different vessel. The vessel is still the same. The instrument is just the same. But it's all of the power infused from the master's hand that makes a difference. So it is with the potter. So it is with the surgeon. So it is with the artist. And I say again, and this is what God said in Isaiah chapter 66. The hand of the Lord shall be made known unto his servant. And if there's ever been a prayer that I have been praying over the last number of months, Lord, I care not what a sort of clothes are on my back. I care not, Lord, how much money's in my bank account. But only if I would have the hand of God, something above men, something that men and women are touched with a power and a dynamic, something that will pull down the strongholds of the enemy and leave men and women changed and challenged by the word of God, the hand of God. Best said is shalom. Let me tell you this. If you're ever going to survive, you'll need the hand of God. You'll need more than Paul Williams. You'll need the hand of God. And as you as an individual are going to survive, if you're going to stand in these dark closing days of time and burn out for God, you'll need more than theology in your head. You'll need the hand of God on your life. That's the key. The hand of God. You know, Ezekiel, 
Ezekiel was that young man. And it says six times that the hand of the Lord was upon him. Above everything else that Ezekiel did. Above everything that Ezekiel said. Whenever men and women saw him and came in contact with him, they were conscious of a power beyond them, that this is something of the hand of God upon the life. Now, here's Elijah, weary, tired, isolated, lonely. And there's some of you here this afternoon, and I'm sure that's where you are. You'll go home to your house meetings, and the ones and twos will gather next week. And you'll just be like Elijah, and you'll maybe say, like under the juniper tree, Oh, God, just come and take us home. But then he got the touch. And it was the touch that made the difference. This touch that this man of God got, first of all, it was a gracious touch. A gracious touch. Here was this man, Elijah, under the juniper tree. And I say again that sometimes we can deal hardly with him. But let me paint the picture for you. Here he comes from the land of Gilead. A man, he's a wild man. And God puts his hand upon him. And he puts a fire within him. And he puts his word in his mouth. And here Elijah has to stand on his own before the king of Israel and he walks in and he said there will be no rain in heaven but according to my word and he spins on his heel and walks out through the palace doors and he walks down to the brook Cherith and there he's alone and he watches the little brook drying and he watches the ravens come and suddenly the last drop of water comes down the river bed what would you have done? Well, I'll tell you what he did. He waited in God. And then the Lord told him to go to Zarephath, the very place where Jezebel lived, the territory of Jezebel. And God says, I want you to go there to Zarephath and there'll be a widow, a widow woman, and she'll feed you with meal until until the famine is over. And then her son died. And he had to raise her son And then he had to walk to Carmel and the whole nation was there. All the false prophets were there. The king was there. His friends were there and he stood alone. And then he watched the false prophets call upon their gods and they didn't do anything and he mocked them. And then he got the 12 stones and he prepared the altar and he repaired the sacrifice and he prayed and the fire fell. And then he ran 40 miles before Ahab and his chariot. And I say to you, see, whenever God puts his hand upon you, it'll drain you of everything that you have, every human resource that you will have. God will bring you to the end of yourself that when I am weak, then am I strong. It was Annie Johnson Flint, that woman of God. She had cancer in her belly, rheumatoid arthritis in her back. She lay with eight pillows every day to try to get some sleep. And she penned that wonderful hymn, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. When we've reached the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no measure. His power has no boundary. Known unto men, for out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. That's a gracious touch. That's what Elijah needed. He didn't need someone to beat him. He didn't need someone to tell him where he was. He knew where he was. He needed a gracious touch. Do you need a gracious touch? Is that where you are today? Lord, I'm weary. I'm tired, Lord. How are you keeping today? Oh, I'm doing well. And the smiles on the face and you say the hallelujahs and the amen. And inside you're under the juniper tree. And maybe there's been tears in your eyes before you got out of bed today. 
This man didn't need someone to take a polythene pipe to. He needed a gracious touch. He needed something of the touch of God. And while no one else knew it, and while no one else maybe knows it about you today, God knew it. And God, through the person of his Son, went to meet the need. And it was then that the angel of the Lord touched the hand of omnipotence touched just a touch this man that was defeated this man that was no longer enjoying what he was once enjoying this man that seemed to be, as it were, physically and literally in a wilderness. Just a touch. A gracious touch. Not only was it a gracious touch, it was a divine touch. I'm glad that there wasn't a man went out to see Elijah. I'm glad that I wasn't alive in the days of Elijah. I'm glad that I wasn't there because I would have went over to him and I'd have lifted my size nine boot and I'd have hit him a kick in the shoulder and said, tighten yourself up. Square your shoulders, man. What are you moping about for? Oh, I'm not feeling well. Well, sure, everyone's not well now. Take a paracetamol and get on with it. <laughs> no, no. You know what happened? Just a touch. You see this angel of the Lord here? It's not Gabriel. No, no. Mind you, if Gabriel was to come into this meeting today, if he was to come and manifest himself and was to walk down the pew and isolate maybe you out today and Gabriel, my, that wonderful angelic being, and if he was to touch you today, you say, oh, some touch. You would contact the papers tomorrow. You'd be in the BBC News on Monday. Oh, Gabriel touched me. This wasn't Gabriel. Maybe if Michael the archangel came, that angel that called to Daniel. Oh, I was in a meeting on Saturday down in Beth said, Shalom, you'll never believe what happened. Michael the archangel came and he touched me. He touched me. You'd ring every friend. You'd reactivate your Facebook account. You'd try to get portraits and pictures. Michael touched me. This is not Michael. This is the pre-incarnate Son of God. This is what the scholars call a, a Christophany. This is the one that met Hagar whenever she was on the run from Sarah. You remember that young woman that was abused and misused and accused. And she runs away out into the wilderness heading back to Egypt. She was fed up with the whole thing and the Christian people had mistreated her and broken her heart and she ran and she was going to go back. She was just in the borders of Egypt and it was there when she sat down and the Bible says that the angel of the Lord found her. Did he find you today? This is the one that met Abraham on the plains of Mamre. This is the pre-incarnate Christ that stood beside Moses at the burning bush. This is the one that Joshua, Joshua met as he stood in Gilgal and he saw the walls of Jericho and he heard the accusations of the enemy and he says, Oh Lord, how am I going to face the enemy? And there was a man that was there and he stood with a drawn sword. This is the one that touched Elijah. The one that met Gideon down in the wine press, the pre incarnate Christ, touched. Touched. Ah, oh, I tell you, a tender touch. You know, one of the most beautiful, one of the most pleasant, one of the greatest. And indeed the greatest people that you ever could have met was the stranger of Galilee. Whenever the woman was caught in adultery in John 8, 
that woman that was broken, I tell you there's a tender touch. Whenever he found the woman at the well in John 4, it was a tender touch. And here the gracious divine touch of God, this man under the juniper tree, weary, lonely, worried, anxious, disturbed, afraid, and he lays down and I think he fell asleep hoping that he wouldn't wake up. And he woke up to feel the touch of the master's hand upon his life. Yes, it was a gracious touch. It was a divine touch. I'll tell you something more. It was a needed touch. He needed it. My dear people, I don't know what you need. I could stand here today and guess and presume. But I don't know your heart. I don't know the thoughts that have went through your mind this week. I don't know the thoughts that have went through your mind even last night when your husband or wife fell asleep. And those thoughts that come through your mind that maybe there's not a creator in this, in this hall today knows what you're going through. And no one would have knew what Elijah was going through. But it was a gracious and a divine, and I say again, it was a needed touch. Oh, Lord, I need that. Lord, somehow I feel that I'm out of touch. Somehow, Lord, I feel that there's a distance between me and thee that used never to be there. And it seemed to be for so many years we were just at a touching distance. But oh, I need something of a fresh touch. There's many touches in the Word of God. There's a healing touch. Maybe there's a mother here today and you need a healing touch. Maybe you have a broken heart there. Maybe you found a lump. You remember in Matthew chapter 8 whenever the Lord Jesus walked into the house of Peter and he saw his mother-in-law there and she was bad with a fever and she was going to die. The, Lord, the word of God says he put out his hand and he touched her. A healing touch. And as the Lord touched her, I can tell you what happened. It says immediately the fever left her. And I don't know who you are today and I don't know where you are. And I don't even know what's on your heart. But oh, if you're here today and you need a healing touch, I can tell you he can give it today. Whenever I and Charlotte were going out, she was diagnosed with epilepsy. Four turns a day. Four times a day she went into those fits. And all it did was to put up the dose of tablets. Put her up to 100, 500, 1,000 milligrams of tablets, 2,000 milligrams of tablets a day. And I remember me and Charlotte started to pray. She was in England at the time. And I was back in Northern Ireland and I was reading through Mark's gospel. Whenever the Lord came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and there was a father who had a boy. The disciples couldn't help him. Psychologists couldn't help him. The world couldn't help him. Doctors couldn't help him. Religion couldn't help him. And the Lord said, bring him to me. And I remember Charlotte myself getting down and seeking God. And about two weeks after that, she has never had a turn since. You know what happened? There is a touch. The touch. Do you need a touch? Lord, on this 10th anniversary, touch me, Lord. Touch me. Then, of course, there's not only a healing touch. There's a restoring touch. You remember in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, whenever the Lord Jesus came to a town called Bethsaida, just where, where we are today. And there was a man in the town of Bethsaida and he was blind. And the Lord Jesus, it says, took him by the hand and he led him out of the village and he put his hands, his fingers into his eyes and he told the blind man to look up the first time that he had looked up for a long time. And he lifted his eyes to heaven and he said, open your eyes. And he said, I see men as trees walking. And you know what the Bible says? He touched him again. 
and restored unto him his sight. And I feel that there's someone here today that would need a healing touch. I feel that there's some here today and you would need a restoring touch. And you've lost the joy and you've lost the passion and you've lost the intimacy and you've lost the hunger and you've lost the victory and you've lost that fire that burned in your belly for so many years and it's barren and it's dry and it's mechanical and it's monotonous and all seems to be gone just like this man. I can tell you in this meeting today he can touch you. A restoring touch. Oh, Lord, that's what I need. I need a restoring touch, Lord. Then, of course, there's a saving touch. And maybe there's someone here today and you're not saved. And you say, well, it's lovely to be here today and it's lovely to sing the hymns, but I'm not saved. I, I don't know God the way you're talking to him about him. Oh, I, I know that there's a God in heaven, but... I don't have any intimacy with him. And my, you're just dead in your trespasses and in sin. And whenever the Lord Jesus went into the village in the town of Nain, and there was a widow coming out, and her boy, her only boy, was dead. Just like you're dead. Dead in sin. The Bible says that the Lord touched him. And raised him up again. We sing sometimes in our own assembly. Shackled by a heavy burden. Neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me. Now I am no longer the same. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And now I know he touched me. And he made me whole. Do you need a saving touch? I'll tell you this, for an ordinary preacher, that if you die in the seat that you're sitting on now and you're not saved, you'll perish and you'll go to hell with all of your religion and with your Bible and with all of your theology. You need more than that. You need a Savior. You need a Savior. He can touch you. He can touch you. Oh, yes, there's a healing touch. There's a restoring touch. There's a saving touch. There's a cleansing touch. You remember Isaiah, Isaiah the man of God, and there he was in the ministry, and there he was serving the Lord, he was, the oracles of God were coming through him, and in the year that King Uzziah died, it was there where he saw the majesty, the beauty of God, and came into the presence of the Lord, and there he said, woe is me, for I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the Lord, the King of glory, and the Bible says, and the word of God says then came an angel with a live coal with the tongs which he had taken off the altar and he he touched me he touched me my and there that angelic being said thine iniquity is purged and thy sin is taken away a cleansing touch I don't need to labor in that today Daniel got a strengthening touch Daniel chapter 10, he was there and he, he was on his knees and upon the palms of his hands and the word of God says, and he touched me. He touched me. Then there's an enabling touch. Saul had a band of men whose hearts God had touched. Then, of course, there's a changing touch. Jacob, down at Penny. He wrestled with the very same angelic being to the break of day and he was depending on his strength for years. And the Bible and the word of God says then the Lord touched him. Touched him at the very place that he used all his strength for so many years, everything that he relied on, every prop that he ever had, God just swept it out of the way and touched him at the place of strength and took all his strength away from him and the sinews swollen shrank and there he came and he limped the rest of his day. He got a touch and he never walked the same again. Oh Lord, I would need a touch like that. 
Lord, I would need to walk different before my family. I would need to walk, Lord, before my work friends and my community. Lord, I've tried to rely on who I am and what I know and all of the props in my life. But somehow, Lord, what you did for Jacob at Peniel, Lord, would you touch me? It was a needed touch. It was a gracious touch. It was a divine touch. I tell you, my dear people, the angel of the Lord just touched. Touch. Just a touch, Lord. Lord, I'm not asking for much today, but oh, Lord, what you did for the leper and what you did for Elijah, what you did for the blind man, what you did, Lord, for Daniel, what you did for Jacob, what you did for Jeremiah, Lord. A touch. Just a touch. Just a touch of your hand, Lord. Just a touch of thy divine presence. Duncan Campbell. That man that was mightily used in the Argyle revival. The Lewis revival. The Hebride revival. Whenever he was saved as a young man. He went out into the battlefield in World War I to Flanders Field. And there he was in... Uh, the infantry and he was on his horse and he was on one of the last charges in Flanders Field and his horse was killed and he was severely wounded and the horse rolled over him and he said the lifeblood was draining from me and I was sure that I was dying and on the last, second charge there was a Canadian trooper came and the horse's hoof touched Campbell on the back and they let a groan out of him. And whenever the trooper had come back, he, he got Campbell and threw him over the, the back of the horse and was taking him back to the casualty field. And Campbell said there in his biography, I was sure that I was going out to meet God. I was sure I was going to meet him, but I wasn't right. I wasn't ready. And he lifted a prayer to God in the back of that mule. He said, Lord, like McShane, Lord, make me as holy as is possible for a saved sinner to be. And in his biography, he said, God touched me. And whenever he was in the casualty station, he could hardly speak a word of English. And he started to quote Psalm 103 in his Gaelic. And within half an hour, seven of those troopers were saved and they didn't even know what had happened. God, there was a touch. And then he lost it. And there's someone here today, I'm sure, and you've lost the touch of God. God used to have his hand on you, sir. Say, dear sister, there was a time when God had his hand on you and you knew it. And he went into the ministry. And for 17 years he preached and he'd done conventions. And it was a good Northern Irish preacher that was on the pulpit. And Campbell was sitting behind him, Dr. Finch. And he was preaching on the hand of God and the deeper life. And Campbell sitting on the pulpit said, Oh, I have no right to speak about the Holy Ghost, for I'm no longer in touch with him. And he went home that night and he told his wife and his daughter to go to bed. And he lay down before the Lord and he said about an hour later, God touched him. And he went out into the Lewis revival and was mightily used by God. Come back tomorrow night and you'll hear, you'll hear something about it. Just down the road, 25 minutes from where we're sitting today, in the little town of Madley, there was a man by the name of John Fletcher. John Fletcher was a man of God. He was a man that John Wesley wanted to take over the Methodist church. And he died before John Wesley died. And Voltaire, that great atheist, that man that hated God and hated the word of God, hated the people of God, before he died, he was asked the question, my dear man, is there anyone in all of the world that you've ever met that while you don't believe in God would convince you that there is a God? And without a shadow of a doubt, Voltaire fired back, Fletcher of Medley. He says, every time I see him, he reminds me that there's a God. There came a day in John Fletcher's life. You know what happened? God touched him. You'll not get that at Bible college. You'll not get that reading theological books. 
You'll not get that with another minister's hand on your head. My dear people, you'll only ever get the touch of God whenever you get down and bend your knees and bow your head and empty your heart and say, Lord, whether I live or whether I die, I want more than what I have, Lord. The hand of God to touch me. A divine touch. A needed touch. It was a second touch. The Bible says that he touched him again. Again. One touch wasn't enough. It took the second touch. And I was thinking last night whenever I was on my knees. Is that why whenever Elisha. I, the man that was going to take the mantle of Elijah. And whenever Elijah said, what is it that you want? He said, sir, oh, I want a double portion of your spirit. I tell you, the only reason why Elijah could give a double portion was because Elijah had a double touch. A double touch. Put him back into the ministry. Recommissioned him. And just like Jeremiah 18, there the potter had the clay and the wheel. And the, and the vessel, the Bible says, was marred. But he made it again. He made it again. And here this man of God, he got another touch. Went in the strength of it for 40 days and 40 nights. Recommissioned into the work. The man that wanted to die never died. A touch. Lord, I need a touch. Touch. A gracious touch. A divine touch. A needed touch. A repeated touch. A restoring touch. Paget Wilkes was a man that was mightily used by the Inland China Mission. He went on to work over there as a missionary in Japan. And in his biography, he said that he was saved. He was serving. But he said there was an unmet need in his heart. He knew the right things to say. He knew the right protocol. He knew the right things to do. But he said there came a day in his Christian experience when God touched him. Let me ask you, and I'm finished, and you've been very patient. Do you need a touch? A needed touch? A divine touch? A healing touch? I tell you, my dear people, let me give you one more story, and then our brother Paul will pray. D.L. Moody, that young man that was only a cobbler. We heard a minister quote one day in a sermon. He says, the world is yet to see what God can do with one young man totally sold out to God. D.L. Moody said, by the help of God, I will be that man. He started his Sunday school, and as far as I remember, there's 2,000, 2,000 young children used to come to his Sunday. And whenever he used to preach and hundreds were getting saved, there used to be two women on the front row. And when D.L. Moody moved with compassion, was preaching the word of God, and hundreds were getting saved, there was two old women down on the front row. And they were praying and they put their head between their knees. And at the end of the meeting, the woman went to Moody and says, Mr. Moody, that was a wonderful sermon and God is using you in a very wonderful way. But you need a touch upon your life, Mr. Moody. Moody couldn't understand it. He says, Lord, you're using me. Souls are being saved and these two women are telling me that there's something more than this. He was walking down the street of Chicago a number of weeks later, praying that God would do a deeper work in his heart. And he said, God put his hand on. He went into the closest room that was there, went in through a door and got down beside his bed and he said, Lord, stay your hand lest you kill me. 
He got onto the pulpit after that and started to preach the very same messages. Same sermons that hundreds were saved at. The same sermons that hundreds were being moved to God through. And the very same man with the very same message, with the very same congregation saw thousands saved. You know why? God touched him. And I'm not here today to tell you that you need a touch. But whoever you are, you'll know that you need it. And all I'm asking you to do today is mean business with God. I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up. I'm not asking you to stand to your feet. But I can tell you this, that if you want a touch with God and from God, you'll climb those little stairs just for a few moments after this meeting and we'll get you jammed in if there's too many of you. And you get down before God, not before me. And you say, Lord, on this 10th anniversary, I need more than what I have. Lord, will you touch me? And I can tell you whenever you wait before the Lord and you do business with God, he'll touch you. He did it for Moody. He did it for Elijah. He's done it for some in this meeting today. And it's the same gentle, divine, gracious, gracious, 